Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate, and today I'm interviewing... Chandler Morrison. Hi there. How are you doing today? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing great. Can you tell me a bit about your writing? Uh, you know, I always tell people that I write... People will ask me you know, what kind of books I write. I, I always say dark, tragic love stories. Because that is... You know, my, my books tend to be across different genres, I guess. They get labeled as different things, but that tends to be at the core of all of them is these uh, love stories between flawed, uh, typically rather miserable people who, um, you know, and their their romances don't tend to end very well. And uh, But I, you know, a big theme in my writing is satire. I, I do uh, a lot of um, sociopolitical satirical commentary, I guess, uh, that's kind of serves as the backdrop for the, uh, the story. So that's how I would describe it. Awesome. How did you start writing in that space with the, the dark romance and um, satire and everything? How did, how did you fall into that? Well, a lot of my favorite authors write um, satire, like, I mean, my two biggest influences are probably Brett Easton Ellis and J.G. Ballard, who I, I just always connected with their writing and and with what they, they did, where they would kind of portray the world in this surreal sort of weird way that, uh, that served as a commentary on, like, where we are today and um, things that are going on in the culture, uh, while that while also not having that be like necessarily the driving force of the book, um, but also having, you know, being a, a part of what makes up its DNA. And because they were a big influence, that was, that was something that really inspired me. And, and the, the love story part, I mean, I write to deal with pain and I tend to be rather susceptible to pain, uh, which is good for my creative output. Um, but I would, you know, my my first book came was coming out of a, a bad relationship, and it was sort of me writing my way out of that bad relationship. And then every book since then has kind of been uh, something similar. And so that's where the the dark tragic love story piece comes in is my own dark tragic love stories. Interesting. So you mentioned that these two influences how did you come to discover those i was a teenager and i i was i was exposed to a lot of you know dark adult oriented stuff at a at a young age like uh, my dad showed me alien at i was i think i was 7 and and then like from there i just i was obsessed and just started seeking out darker and darker stuff uh you know i had a kind of a um a, I, I guess you could say a bit of a, a difficult childhood and so i just i gravitated toward toward stories that were darker than my own uh, uh life and mm -hmm. and so i would i just kept going down you know like rabbit hole after rabbit hole looking for something that was going to like scratch that that itch and and that led me to Brett Easton Ellis and and uh, particularly it was uh, like less than zero on American Psycho are on a lot of like lists of you know like darkest books um, Crash by Ballard is is up there and uh, so I I just uh, something, like I said, I was, it was like uh, my early teens that I discovered them and it sort of just something, something clicked in me with those two particular authors. And, and that has shaped me going forward. That is so interesting. I, I completely, I totally feel that I, I've talked to a lot of writers who fall into that too, where it's, it's like seeking out some of these more horror or darker spaces and stuff. And it, it gives you a place to express yourself and to express those emotions. And I, I think it's so important. Totally. I think, you know, what, what dark art has uh, to offer is that 
even in in most of the the darkest books like you know i'm thinking in particular like like brett's work or or ballard's um there's there's always some light to be found or some sort sort of beauty uh even even in the darkest elements and and it it sort of teaches us how to to find light and beauty even in the 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 darkest spaces and Mm -hmm. and that can be really therapeutic when you're in a dark place of your own yeah totally so so we've been kind of talking about the genre of it and other things but can you give me the plot description for your most recent novel sure yeah so uh, it's called american narcissus and it's about these four lost souls who who all live in los angeles and they all of them for different reasons have kind of lost whatever faith they might have had in the future and they they all get intertwined in in these uh, romantic entanglements and they're trying to to make the make them work while also reconciling with the notion that they just don't believe that there is a, a future that we can we can hope for and and they're all kind of connected and uh and and it takes place in this near future sort of dystopian version of los angeles and there's a there's a sex robot in it uh, as well that um is uh an important factor and yeah and that comes out uh may 15th awesome now you also live in la right i do live in la yes how have your experiences living there influenced your writing if if at all but with this book it's being being set there and everything i'd imagine there was some some crossover oh yeah yeah hugely i mean i've lived in a lot of places los angeles is the uh, california is the seventh state that I've, I've lived in in my life and and it's the only one that i've lived in that that feels like this like living breathing thing that has its own personality and its own desires and whims and it's like an organism and and i always feel like i'm sort of in communication with it i guess or it's in communication with me i don't know like it just feels and not that i'm special i think it's you know i think everybody who lives here kind of has that that experience with it because it's just such a it's a weird place i mean it's um it's just a very strange city to live in and and you know for for all of its beauty uh and glamour there's so much darkness here too um and in fact i'd say that probably the the darkness and the uh grime of it all can can outweigh the the beauty and the glamour like you know people i tell people all the time that i uh i hate living here 95 percent of the time um it's like there's a lot of really awful shallow people and you know all the stereotypes are true about the types of people who come to los angeles uh it, you know i don't know that i'm necessarily withstanding from that and you know that it's it's overcrowded and the traffic is horrible and uh the the crime is is through the roof um but so 95 percent of the time i i don't particularly like it but there is five percent of the time um and it's and that five percent of the time never lasts a whole day it rarely lasts longer than an hour i usually get it for like a moment or a few moments where i'm hit with this very distinct feeling of like okay this is why i live here you know whether it's a sunset or like i'm you know just at i'm I'm out somewhere and 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 experiencing something that that i could only experience in los angeles and that five percent of the time is what has uh, kept me here for the last six years and probably will indefinitely uh you know it's a a, like I said, a, a really 
oppressive kind of place to live at times, uh, most times. But the those those rewards, even though they tend to be few and somewhat far between, they make it all worth it. And so that, you know, as a as a long way to answer your question, was all kind of something I was trying to communicate in this book is is the juxtaposition of the um the beauty and the glamour with the darkness and uh you know the what it's what it's like to live in a place like like that. Because even though it is yeah. a near future, a near future dystopia, it's you know the, the dystopia that that is depicted is not terribly far from the dystopia that we currently live in. Yeah, and I I think to that point, I, I mean I'm of the opinion that we all have certain places and cities and things that we're connected to and that we just kind of get. I mean I've. I've been to a lot of different places in the U.S. and traveled a lot, and there are certain ones that will connect with me for whatever reason. And I, I think that you can, you might, it might not be a love thing. You might not love the place, but you understand it. And a lot of times, for writers, it can make you want to create art about it. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I, yeah. So I, I think what you said was a, a excellent explanation of all of that Thank you. so over your career how do you think that your writing process has shifted i don't know that it it has all that much i i have kind of a a weird writing process just in talking with other other writers i, I guess it's a little non-traditional in that i i don't write in sequential order like when i sit down to write a book i'm not writing like you know the the beginning and then the next scene and then the next scene and then the next scene i'm i'm writing scenes as they they come to me and then i kind of piece them all together as i go and so i'll write you know maybe a scene from the beginning and then a scene from the end and then a scene somewhere in the middle and and i have kind of a general idea at the outset of where it's all going to go but it starts to, you know, click more as, as I write and, but it's, it's never in order. And, um, and I, I don't write every day. I, when I'm working on a book and I'm really invested in it, I, I tend to write every day, not because of some, you know, rule that was, uh, posited by a, by a Twitter blowhard that, if you're a writer, you have to write every day. Um, but just because I want to, you know, I, like I, I want to be uh, in that 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 space um, as as often as possible, and so it becomes an obsession that uh, that I spend most of my free time working on. And then when I finish a book, I tend to take time off between finishing one and then starting another one because if I don't, I tend to find that the previous book will bleed into the next one and so i like to give myself a, a buffer in between to prevent that from happening and and it usually it works out uh, really well because whatever whatever sort of pain like i said i you know i write from trying to to, to figure out some sort of pain and and whatever whatever pain that i'm trying to work through tends to tends to be spread at you know pretty manageable intervals where you know it's not like one thing after another but um you know with 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 american narcissus it was it was my own sense of like you know how do you find meaning and connection in a in a world with a, a future you don't believe in and you know some of my other books like uh like along the path of torment what was written as a way to deal with the cancer that i was going through at the time and um you know how you you reconcile uh what looks like a, a death sentence with you know getting out of bed every day and so so those types of, of things but but that's kind of how it's gone throughout my whole career is just you know writing from a place of pain and then uh approaching it from a really sort of disjointed out of sequence uh approach yeah, I I completely get that. I mean, especially the part where you're, where you're talking about how it's like bursts and then you 
don't write for a little bit and then you start the next thing and you need to have that space. I mean, for m- myself personally, I am a project person, so I will have one thing that I am doing and that is all consuming and I can't really look at the other things around it until I have completed whatever book or story I'm doing. Um, I but, think, yeah, I think that's, that's, that yields the best results. Like a, a novel should be and uh, the product of obsession. I think, you know, like I think that the best works of art are, are, are a result of the, the artists obsessive <laughs> neuroses and, and whatever they're, they're trying to uh, work out. And so mm-hmm. uh, I think that's, it's just a good way to, to go about it. Kind of speaking to the disjointed thing though, I'm curious what, type of scene do you find yourself starting with it's i would i don't know that there's a specific type of scene that i always start with it's as much as just whatever whatever's at the forefront of my mind there's always a scene that like i i really want to get out and and i want to get it get it down while it's it's fresh and it usually comes as a result of um something I've experienced you know I write a lot of party scenes there's a lot of scenes that take place in uh, parties and and I don't like parties I don't like going to parties I it's but I see it as kind of like it's like going to the office um, I'll, I go to more far more parties than I would prefer to go to because I get inspiration from them and mm-hmm. so I, and there's a lot you can, you can do with a party scene. That's very you know dynamic and there's a lot, you know, going on. And so, um, so while I don't know, you know, that that's, that, that there's a specific type that I start with, you know, like that does tend to be a common one that, that shows up in all my books, typically at multiple points through the book. And, um, but, but yeah, it's, you know, it's whatever's, whatever's at the forefront of my mind. And I, when I sit down to start, I, I typically have, like I said, a, a rough roadmap. It's been gestating for a while. I don't start writing something as soon as the idea comes. I let it cook for a bit, uh, kind of tease out some of the, um, you know, broad strokes of it before before I sit down and really, really go at it. And so by the time I sit down and write the first scene, whether it's the opening scene uh, or a scene from the middle or a scene from the end, um, by the point that I've I've started writing, I'm I'm writing in the uh, toward a certain direction, and I have a kind of general idea of uh, of where I'm going to go. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Of course, yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I'm I'm curious if there are any other places that are I, I don't know it's, it's more more unconventional, um, such such as parties that you look for inspiration because I feel like. A lot of the time it's it's more traditional things like, well, I was reading a book or I was watching this movie and it did that. But are there any like real world places that you go to get inspired for your writing? Uh, not I wouldn't say there's a lot of real world places I, I go because I don't particularly like the real world. So I, I avoid it as much as I can. I prefer to stay in my apartment. Uh, and And when I do go out into the real world, it's. It's because I know I'm I'm probably going to get I can get something even if it's just a line of dialogue like I'm just like everywhere I go like even if I'm going out with friends I mean, I mean uh, no offense to any of my friends who are who are all great but but most times I get invited to anything I would much rather just stay home but. I, and then, <laughs> yes, I am all I'm I'm very introverted and my whole family so. is and it's like yeah yeah totally get that yeah but you know i go a lot of times because i you know I, with with the i incentivize myself with like you know i don't really want to do this but i i'll probably get something that i can use um but but in terms of like other places that it happens i mean i uh a lot of times i'll get ideas um uh, when I, I i run but again, because I don't like to go outside, I run on a treadmill in my apartment. And typically, uh, 
like when when I'll get hit with ideas is is like past the threshold where I feel like I'm going to die, you know, and then the endorphins start kicking in and it's like this crazy, you know, the crazy runner's high, which is really why I run is is just for that runner's high because I'm addicted to it. But but when you know, it starts feeling like I'm just completely disassociating from the world and and I'm uh, having these like waves of endorphins and endocannabinoids or whatever the chemicals are in your body that that produce that runner's high like as those start pumping it's it's common that like I'll I'll, I'll get ideas in that that space so which you know some people smoke weed to get inspired that uh never worked for me but um you know getting getting high on endorphins does so just a different form of it I guess that's really interesting. I haven't had anyone had anyone say that yet on the show. It's I mean, I don't I, I always I don't recommend that people run the way that I run because it's it's not particularly healthy and you're not supposed to run for the runner's high, but you know it's it's healthier than uh than alternatives. So and, and it's it's an interesting way to get ideas and get inspired. Um yeah. So I'm I'm curious, what did your path to publication look like? So I, my very first book was Dead Inside, and and it was self published initially because I wrote it and and was in a very dark place when I wrote it and coming out of a really dark relationship and and I thought you know like like nobody's gonna want to publish this it's it's just too weird and not not mainstream enough. And, and I didn't know really anything about indie publishing at the time. I mean, I was, uh, I was 21 and I didn't, I just didn't, I didn't know anything about publishing in general, really. Uh, but I, you know, I Googled how to, how to self publish. And I, I, so I self published it. And then, you know, a few things happened. Uh, Donald Ray Pollock, uh, who's a, a friend, um, because we, we lived somewhat somewhat close to each other. And, and when I lived in Ohio, he blurbed it, which gave it a bit of a boost. And then it just kind of got a little bit of traction on its own. And I, uh, you know, after it had been out for, for a few years, I submitted it to uh, uh, an indie publisher um, who's now largely defunct. Um, and and they they accepted it. And then my editor at the time was, and, and in between this time, I'd, I'd self-published a couple other books, uh, another novel and a short story collection. Um, but then I took, I took Dead Inside Down because it was going to be published by this, uh, this indie press. And uh, there was some pre-release controversy about it that it, uh, led the just based on the the content of the book um, that uh, and there was some some online backlash and the, uh, that led the publisher to drop it and they they fired my editor um, and uh, but I you know there was I got bombarded with publishers after that who all wanted it and well I mean the the controversy <laughs> that that yeah. makes sense uh, and so I kind of had my like pick of the litter and so. I went with um, a publisher that was that was new at the time, uh, and which is now uh, Dead Sky uh, Publishing. They were at the time um, uh, under a different name, and they uh, and, and run by different folks. But they they took Dead Inside uh, as well as another book that I had just kind of like you know sit, sitting on the back burner that I hadn't done anything with. And, um, you know, I've, I've worked with a couple other publishers as well. Uh, just, just folks I've gotten to know being in the scene, um, and I, that I wanted to work with, but, uh, but Dead Sky, um, was, uh, and has been, you know, like my, my mainstay and, uh, they're just, just really great to work with and, um, and, and have, been, have given this book a lot of support. Um, this book in particular, it was it was cool how it how it came about because the they came to me and 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 were 
you know, pleased with the how, how my other books had performed for them and said, like, write whatever you want. And the book that, that you've, you've always wanted to write and haven't written yet, if you've got that, write it and we'll publish it sight unseen. And, and so I did, you know, I, I, and for, for a few years, I, I felt like I was, you know, Dead Inside remains my most popular book. And I, I, I while I, I am true to myself with every book, I also felt like I was kind of doing things to make the fans of Dead Inside happy. Mm. And, yeah. And yeah. so I, I felt like I was kind of, kind of been put into a box that I wanted to, to, to break out of a bit. And, and Dead Sky gave me the freedom to do that, to just write whatever I wanted. Uh, and, um, and so that's, that's what I did. And it was, uh, I'm grateful that they've, they've given it a, a platform. Well, that's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think it's so important for young writers and people, I mean, people that have even already been published just to hear other authors' stories and a little bit more about how the industry works. So thank you. I just have one last question actually t- for today. This was a really excellent interview. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. My last one is just what do you have coming up? So I will be doing uh, you know some other um, podcast appearances. I uh, I've got some, some some events that I'll be doing uh, for American Narcissus that are still being planned. Definitely going to be one in here in Los Angeles, one uh, in Cleveland. Um, looking to get something booked in New York uh, as well, um, but that's uh, still kind of up in the air. And and as for like you know what I'm what I'm working on now, I'm I've got a, another book that I've uh, I've been working on for a bit that involves uh, a luxury cruise and uh, uh, a cult and a breakup is what I'll what I'll say about it. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So that's that's what I've got uh, going down the pipe. Awesome. Well, everyone, please go support all of Chandler Morrison's books and everything that. Is yet to come. That that next one sounds really exciting too. And congratulations on American Narcissus coming out so soon. For Thank Read you. Between the Lines, my name is Molly Southgate. I'm Chandler Morrison. Let's end this the way all great stories end. Happily ever after. The yeah. end. Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. You can follow the show on Instagram and Facebook at Read Between the Lines Podcast and on Twitter at RBTL Podcast. Make sure to follow the authors who I've been talking to to hear all about their upcoming projects and also because they're cool people. This show is hosted by me, Molly Southgate, and produced and edited by my dad, Rob Southgate. Read Between the Lines is a Southgate Media Group production, and you can find all the great content put on by the network at southgatemediagroup.com. You can read the story of how I and many other podcasters started in the anthology book Pod Life, which you'll find at the link in the show notes. Also in the show notes are links to buy the books featured on this episode. Using those links supports this show and the incredible authors being interviewed. Have a great week and keep reading.